Uh, all right. So let me. Um, um, all right. So let me let me shift to what uh, I mean, one of the motivations to understand these polymer physics is to try to understand what determines cell and tissue stiffness. And mostly, I think I'm going to talk talk about uh, uh, tissue stiffness. And again, the idea for this is from uh, comes largely from imaging that if we look at something like the actin cytoskeleton underneath the cortex of a white blood cell uh, by electron microscopy, it's, it's all these fiber networks. In this case, it's almost entirely actin. And you see as a kind of a, a fiducial marker, some little clathrin coated uh, pits that have started to come in. And so the, the mesh size of these networks is a few hundred nanometers. But and on a much larger scale, if you look at the collagen matrix and something like a, a wounded eye uh, um, uh, lens tissue uh, up shown on the upper right, you get the same kind of you know, basic idea, these kind of straight, uh, in this case, slightly straighter looking collagen fibers, but on a much, much bigger uh, length scale, the mesh size here is tens of, is, is, is microns, uh, several microns. And you'll see in that net network a few kind of ghostly fiber blasts moving um, <coughs> uh, during the wound healing process. And if you look at something like a blood clot, it's the same generic structure. These, uh, this color, colorized uh, scanning EM from John Weisel uh, shows in turquoise the fibrin strands in a slightly diluted whole blood clot uh, that surround red blood cells and that are also pulled taut by these purple um, uh, uh, stained platelets. So it's, a, it's the same, but it's the same kind of feature. You have a fairly open network here. Again, the mesh size is, is at least five microns or about five microns, the size of a red cell, uh, but it's the same kind of thing, fiber networks everywhere. All right, so you would expect again from what we showed before that if, if tissues and cells and stuff are made out of these fiber networks and we increase the shear stress, we're going to um, uh, increase the shear modulus. And again, based on this, I show you this cartoon picture again to point out one of the potentially uh, 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 useful biological features of making cells and tissues, cells especially, making them out of uh, semi-flexible polymers instead of polyacrylamide or flexible polymers. And that is that you can change the shear modulus by a lot, by you know, an order of magnitude or so, just by changing the shear strain. Or as, as Margaret showed you know, in, in that early paper, you can change it by applying a shear stress. And that means that if, if a cell or a tissue wants to change its stiffness, it can do so just by activating motors and pulling on it. It doesn't have to increase cross-link density. It doesn't have to synthesize new polymer. It just has to pull on it and, and the, the material will become stiffer and it can relax it and the material becomes softer. So it's a biological control thing that is made possible by the fibrous nature of things. Okay, so if it's the fibrous nature that's important, how well do these things that we've learned from the polymer physics of these biopolymers, how well do they describe tissue rheology? And it turns out really terribly. And one of the, um, we started to, to look at a bunch of tissues and, and there's lots of literature on, on, on tissue stiffness, but if you take a tissue like the brain and measure its shear modulus as a function of shear strain, it does not get stiffer than uh, at high strains than it is at low strains. Um, if, if anything, it gets slightly softer. Uh, so we're not getting this effect that we expected at all. Uh, and you might argue, well, brain's kind of a weird tissue, doesn't really have a collage, collagenous extracellular matrix. Um, maybe it's special for brain, but you can also do it with liver. And liver does have a collagen-based extracellular matrix. Uh, it's got lots of cytoskeletal things in the cells, uh, but it also does not get stiffer with increasing shear strain. And, and again, th the reason it doesn't get stiffer or appears to get softer is not because we are damaging the tissue by subjecting it to a large shear deformation. Um, it's a perfectly reversible elastic response. Those different colors are just repeats of doing it from high to low strain. So to, just to 
<coughs> sorry, to demonstrate that it's just a, a physical effect. There's nothing rearranging. And 40% strain is a little bit on the high side, but it's not a crazy uh, um, strain for a piece of liver tissue to, uh, to experience. So it's not physiologically an unreasonable thing, but, but the simple polymer physics picture is not telling us. And then we've also looked at what happens in uniaxial compression. So we built this rheometer that has a little aquarium on it that allows us to measure the shear modulus um, superimposed on static deformation, you know, compression or extension. And the little aquarium around it is so that a liquid can flow in and out if, if, if the sample wants to change volume. Okay, and then something interesting happens. If you take a brain or other tissues, and, and rather than increasing the shear strain amplitude, we apply a uniaxial strain to it and then measure the stiffness. Then something interesting happens. Uh, it, it does not happen in extension. So if we stretch a piece of brain on the right and the positive uh, 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 strain numbers, uh, stretching a brain does not change its shear modulus, but compressing it does make the, the brain stiffer, actually a lot stiffer. And uh, again, it's a reversible elastic response. If we first compress it uniaxially to give it a high shear modulus, if we just return it to its resting height, the modulus drops back to where it used to be. And again, these are not uh, unrealistic uh, 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 strains we're subjecting it to. And it also happens in the liver. It happens in every soft tissue we've looked at. They all get stiffer when you compress them than when you stretch them. And that has an interesting uh, consequence because in the body, uh, most soft tissues are compressed or stretched or something. They're not just floating around in tissue culture medium. And so the local stiffness that a cell might feel may not be the, the stiffness that we measure once we excise that tissue out and put it in a rheometer uh, in vitro. And uh, again, just to point out that this, this response of the liver is exactly the opposite of what uh, a collagen or a fibrin gel would do. Okay, and so the, the kind of the potential biological significance of this is that if we again do this kind of Gardell weight, weight sort of thing and compute the shear modulus, not as a function of shear strain, but as a function of shear stress in this, case compressive stress, but measured in millimeters of mercury, which is what you know clinician types are always measuring for blood pressure or interstitial pressure or tumor pressure in the growing uh, 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 cancer. If we look at the shear modulus as a function of compressive stress, then again, it rises in the brain and it rises in the liver and it rises in a range of compressive stress that are exactly the, the magnitudes of the compressive stresses that change during the growth of a, of a tumor in a soft tissue like the brain, or that change when your blood pressure goes up or, or, or you know, anything else. And of course the compressive stresses during trauma like concussion or, or just getting punched in the stomach uh, or even just sitting down, those compressive stresses are way bigger than these numbers. So, so the tissues are constantly getting subjected to, um, to stuff like that. And that has this consequence illustrated in this really nice paper where, where <coughs> um, uh, 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 Bailey's group has looked at the stiffness of the brain by magnetic resonance elastography measured either in the animal or out of the animal, same brain, um, I, I, yeah, same brain. And, and what's characteristic in this sort of confusing looking histogram, if you uh, first focus just on the blue dots and the, or the blue uh, bars and the, and the uh, orange bars, those are measured at 100 Hertz. Uh, the blue is measured in vivo while the brain is still in the skull. Uh, and the orange ones are when the brain's taken out, out of the skull. Or do I have it backwards? No, I'm sorry, I have it backwards. Blue is taken out of the skull, orange is in the skull. And when the brain is in the skull, it, the shear modulus appears to be twice as big as it is when you take it out of the skull. And, uh, and it's not because the brain degraded, 
it, I, I think it's because of the pressure that these soft tissues are usually subjected to. All right, so why is this? Why is there this big mismatch? And, and part of it uh, may have to do uh, uh, with the structure of actual tissues. And so one uh, very uh, kind of uh, intuitively uh, uh, provoking image is this beautiful decellularized uh, um, uh, uh, scanning EM from commonly on fleck of fat tissue. So that thing you see on the, on the left is the decellularized ghost of fat. Uh, and those little open holes are where the fat cell used to be. Fat cells are pretty big. They're like 50 micron diameter things full of fat. Uh, and you can dissolve them away. And what's left is the extracellular matrix made out of a combination of kind of collagen four sheets uh, shown schematically on the right and collagen fibers. So that's the matrix. Uh, but most of the volume is occupied by cells. And this is a feature that shows up everywhere that in biology, fiber networks in a real tissue or an object are usually never by themselves. The, even the cytoskeleton, if you look at the cytoskeleton again from these uh, you know, super resolution images that are now possible, the cytoskeleton at least near the nucleus is just crammed full of little objects, ribosomes, uh, vesicles, all kinds of volume conserving things are filling the space inside the voids. The blood clot I've already shown you and things like fat tissue, if you don't decellularize the, the fat tissue and look at what's inside, you see these kind of golf ball sized kinds of uh, fat cells that are surrounded by these delicate but very strong collagen fibers. And the, the response of the, of the tissues is pretty much dependent on the fibers. The cells are not doing the stiffness work that's the extracellular matrix is doing it, but the cells are, are confining the matrix in a particular form. And you see this everywhere. You see this in, in, at a much bigger length scale in uh, things like uh, fungi or, or, or rootlets uh, uh, that what's shown on the upper left is this beautiful image of a, fungal cell, which has made what looks like a fiber network, but in this case, the fiber isn't a polymer, it is a, uh, an ex a, a very long hyphal extension of the cell. It's a long, incredibly long branched tube that has a diameter of a couple of microns. And now the mesh size here is tens of microns. And this is what it looks like if you grow it in tissue culture medium. But in real life, these things are growing in dirt and sludge and whatnot, and they're encapsulating particles inside. And so there's this explosion of work on taking materials like this uh, to make into things, in this case, into things like the soles of shoes or textiles or building blocks, all kinds of stuff. Um, and and uh, I'll skip the plant e example for a moment, but also if you look at the bottom, even bacteria do this. When bacteria start making biofilms and stop just being single uh, uh, bacteria that swim around, they express their own polymer matrix, usually made from polysaccharides that surrounds them. But what's shown in the uh, lower right picture is the bio bacterial biofilm taken from a catheter or some implant of a patient in which the uh, bacteria has not only secreted its own extracellular matrix to surround the bacterial cells, but it's also um, somehow usurped the blood coagulation enzymes of the host to form a fiber network in which these bacteria are formed. So the mechanical properties of this biofilm are presumably a composite of all that. Okay, so we've set about to try to understand, you know, how this particle in a, in a fiber network, is, is that the explanation for why tissues respond so differently from polymer networks? And the first approach is kind of the, the, the simplest reconstitution thing. Rather than polymerize a fiber network in, in you know, a phosphate buffered saline or something, we've polymerized it in a solution that contains uh, objects, in this case, dextran beads, polysaccharide beads. And pictorially, what that looks like on a very big length scale, those black circles are the uh, polystyrene or the polysaccharide beads. And the blue, the green uh, fuzz are, are, are fluorescently labeled fibrin strands. We can't uh, uh, discern the individual network structure, but it looks like those fiber networks I showed you before uh, that are surrounded by the, uh, the surrounding these objects. So the objects occupy about 40% volume fraction or so. Uh, 
Okay. So if we do that, if we take a fibrin gel, which again, to remind you on the right, had it been by itself, it would soften in compression, stiffen and stretch. Uh, but if we now start putting objects into it, the beads into it, uh, we very uh, rapidly suppress the stiffening and stretch and convert softening and compression into stiffening and in, in, in compression. So as the volume fraction of beads starts getting big, but importantly, not yet jammed. <clears throat> so we don't think it's particle-particle interactions. Uh, we can flip compression softening to compression stiffening and make something that, that um, used to stiffen um, it, to look something like liver. And all we did was take the fiber network and stick particles in it. All right. And the, the trick of the particles converting the softening matrix into a stiffening matrix depends on the boundary condition between the particle and the matrix. The uh, experiment I showed you before, the particles did not stick to the matrix, they're able to slide. But in a tissue, the cells do stick to the matrix. So now we've repeated this experiment using uh, polysaccharide beads that do stick to fibrin. And now we can achieve this compression stiffening at much lower volume fractions, 30% or so is plenty to convert something that's softened in compression to something that's stiffened. And the other interesting feature of this trick is that the particles themselves do not have to have a shear modulus. Uh, they just have to be volume conserving and, and, and presumably have a surface tension. So we got from Jasna Bruich's lab and Angus McMullen a few years ago, just a, a, a surfactant stabilized liquid, drop, uh, liquid droplets. Uh, two sizes, red and, 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 and blue, big and small. Uh, and again, at 30% volume fraction, you can take something like a fiber network that in, shown in green that does not stiffen in, in compression and convert it to something that does beautifully stiffen in compression, even though the things that inside it uh, aren't themselves stiff. They have a surface tension, but that's it. They don't have, they're not solids. Okay, so the other approach is to do something more tissue-like to build a, a minimal tissue by forming a matrix, in this case, a collagen matrix, and embedding into its cells. In this case, they're, they're uh, glioblastoma cells, but, uh, but it doesn't really so much matter what the cell is as long as it can attach to the network and multiply. Okay, so we're gonna to try to make a tissue de novo from a strain softening matrix and uh, a, a bunch of cells. So we start off, with a collagen gel in which there are a few percent by volume of, um, uh, of cells, uh, two different kinds of glio uh, glioma cells. And when the volume fraction of those cells is very small, uh, they can attach the matrix and pull on it, but that by itself isn't sufficient to cause them to become stiffer in compression the way the brain would be. But then, we just leave these cultures uh, alone for a week or so and allow the cells to multiply. And as they become more abundant, and, and but they do other things, they change their shape, they're no longer spheres, they, they probably attach to each other. So who knows what else is happening? But after a week, the same material suddenly becomes beautifully um, um, uh, compression stiffening. And, uh, and, and again, the cell density is quite, uh, quite small now. And in the, the elastic modulus itself drops to almost nothing if you get rid of the collagen. So the collagen is required to have a shear modulus, but whether it stiffens or softens is somehow dependent on the cells being there. Okay, so how does this work? There's, there's several possible models to explain this. And the first one I believe came from Vivek Shinoy and, and Jingyu Chen and his group who took this picture of relatively soft objects in a fibrous network and asked what happens when I uniaxially compress it? What happens is that um, the inclusions, if they are soft, will become, will become squished in the Z direction. So the force is coming from the top down. So they will become sm uh, you know, smaller in the Z direction. And, but they will dilate in the two orthogonal directions. And 
What happens now if they drag the fibers that are connected to them along with them? The collagen fibers, for example, that already happen to be vertical when the object got compressed, those things will probably also buckle and lose resistance to shear modulus. But they're a relatively small number compared to the fibers that are on top or the bottom of this initially spherical inclusion that now became kind of oblate ellipsoid-like. Those um, uh, collagen fibers will become, that, that network will become biaxially stretched, both on top and the bottom. And Vivek showed a few years ago that biaxial stretching of fiber networks is even more dramatically um, strain stiffening than stiffening in response to uniaxial strain or shear strain. Uh, biaxial stretching really stiffens it up. And that is the origin of why the composite becomes stiffer. This massive transfer uh, or massive forcing of collagen fibers not to buckle, but to biaxially stretch. And so if you make a, a model with that uh, uh, feature in mind, you can show that you can take a fiber network shown in black that does not have inclusions that again, softens and compression, stiffens and stretch and start putting in these constraints into how the fibers must reorient when you apply uniaxial compression to the composite. And as the density increases, you start pushing down the uh, strain stiffening and pushing uh, and reversing the strain softening and making it into um, strain stiffening. So that's one way of doing it. The well, other way of doing it, left. sorry. Perfect, perfect. The other way of doing it is from, again, the Macintosh lab the work with Jordan Shivers and, and, and their colleagues that asked about the opposite um, extreme. What if the particles inside the fiber network are infinitely stiff? So they conserve both uh, volume and shape. And they start off randomly distributed. And now you start compressing uniaxially this whole thing. And then look, look at what happens to both the uh, displacement of the particles and the conformation of the fibers that surround the particles. And what they, what they show is that at the, in, 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 how should I say, in, in um, uniaxial extension, so in positive uh, epsilon numbers, most of the um, um, uh, deformations of the fibers go into stretching modes. Um, and, and that in compression, you start off kind of uh, um, uh, bending dominated and become stretching dominated. And the more you deform it, the more you force the filaments to become stretched. Not exactly for the same reason that, that the Shinoi uh, uh, Chen uh, model has it, but because the uh, uh, particles being randomly distributed in the sparsely connected network, they move um, themselves in a very non-affine uh, way and drag the fibers with them. And just by computing the orientation and the stretching of the fibers, you can again uh, show that the, the um, uh, G prime will increase uh, when you, uh, uh, when you uh, compress the fiber in a manner that depends on how many particles they are and how, how massively they perturb the deformation of the fibers. Okay, so there's, the, and there's one other, uh, a very pretty way of, of, of achieving compression stiffening in a fiber network that comes from uh, Jennifer Schwartz's group uh, uh, who, who asked, uh, uh, what happens if you now don't take a, a very sparsely connected uh, uh, network, but you connect it, uh, you know, isostatically or or more? You put in more more um, uh, bonds to it, but you also make those bonds not flexible, as we've assumed in the past, but but rigid. So if you want to to deform the matrix, you also have to pay a penalty uh, for bending the crosslink, not just bending or stretching the filament. And that model also gives rise um, uh, to, to compression stiffening. It's as though the uh, bending uh, constraint is, is like, a, like an equivalent particle in it. 
And again, and, and, and the fourth way you can get to compression stiffening is, is, is by particle jamming. If the particles themselves are stiffer than the matrix around it, and you compress it so much that force chains start developing in the, in the fibers, that will of course also change the elastic response. But interestingly enough, in the experiments we've done, we don't need the particles to touch each other in order to change the mechanical properties of a fiber network and make it look like a, a, a tissue. Okay, so let me finish there, that, that the contrast between fiber networks and tissues is pretty striking. That fiber networks soften when you compress them, stiffen when you shear and stretch them. But soft tissues, which are made out of these fiber networks, don't. They stiffen when you compress them and they soften in extension and to some extent in shear. And again, there's also no obvious relation between the shear modulus and the Young's modulus. Uh, that has been explored less for tissues than for fiber networks, I believe, but it's, it, it could be an important thing to understand. And that the way you can convert the fiber-like response to a tissue-like response is to start putting volume conserving particles in it that constrain the, uh, uh, the, the, the configuration changes that the fibers can undergo. Okay, let me stop here and just thank all the people that, that did the work in the, back when we uh, could actually be real and uh, virtually uh, in the little boxes. Okay, thanks a lot for, for, for your attention. I guess I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Paul, for a wonderful talk. So I will start by asking some questions that are in the chat. So uh, the first question here that I wanted to ask is from uh, Thomas Weiss Jackson. And Thomas is asking, what role does the shear modulus play in organs such as brain or liver? Will they experience shear deformation in vivo? Yeah, so they 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 do experience shear deformation in in vivo uh, uh, during things like uh, 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 concussions. So so depending on how the force is delivered, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of a massive shear wave propagates through the brain, as well as of course a, a kind of a compressive wave. Uh, so uh, and and uh, and also like uh, uh, um, you know uh, turning your head. Uh, right and left really quickly is also inducing shear shear at the kind of the interface between different uh, uh, um, like the dura and the brain underneath it. So those things will 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 occur even in the in the 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 uh, 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 brain. I think not normally during like you know probably not during tumor growth or or just normal changes in blood pressure, but for sure during these kind of like concussion sorts of scenarios. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Paul. And so the next question is from Robin Bruinsma, and then there is a related question from Jin Hua Jing. So Robin is asking, does the shear modulus of the cytoplasm increase under compression? And then I will, I will also uh, uh, read Jin Hua's question. He's asking, related to Robin's, uh, Robin's question, since cells are heterogeneous, for example, nucleus and cytoplasm, how can one separate contributions from different components? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I, 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 I don't, I, I, I don't know. Um, and, and it's, so the, the question of whether the shear modulus of a cell increases <coughs> with compression, I think is still uh, kind of unresolved because there are, uh, there are no, uh, we have no way of applying a pure shear deformation to a compressed cell. Um, we've recently gotten a new AFM that might do it. And I, th I think that people like, like Atefas Nasios and others have, 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 uh, oh. uh, 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 have done some measurements in that direction. But most, most data that I know are of putting compressive forces on a cell, not, not Paul, a static Paul, compressive force. That's not what I meant. Paul, I meant... You know? Sorry. Paul? Yes. That's not what I meant. I meant oh, if, you take, if you take cytoplasm and you put a small bead in there and you use micromechanics and you measure the shear modulus of the cytoplasm with everything present, does that show... Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Um, so we... Um, oh, geez. Um, has anyone done that? Um, uh, we've, I'm not aware that anyone's done it unless someone 
and the listening uh, listening has done it. But we have we have thought we have tried to take like a Xenopus egg extract or something, or make a reconst or, or a platelet extract, make a reconstituted cytoplasmic gel and do this compression stiffening. And I I don't know what the answer is. Okay. Thanks. Um, um, but it's, yeah, it's an experiment we've been wanting to do for a while. And I, I don't think we've done it because we can't get the materials, and, but someone else may have done it. So I know that Ming Guo's lab at MIT has been looking at, you know, mechanics in the cytoplasm by doing uh, 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 microreology, but I'm not sure if he has yeah. looked at what happens under compression. Yeah, it's, it's a, it, it, I, I, doing it in situ in the cell is going to be, I, I think, tricky. But, but I think it also raises this question that, that the, I, I don't, the microreology is, even driven microreology is measuring, you have the spherical object that you're moving laterally. It's measuring a kind of a, con, a, kind of a combination of shear and compression. Right. Yeah, that 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 is its own. Yeah. Yeah, and and the the the, yeah, the whole question of of how to how do we understand um, uh, or how do we interpret single cell mechanics because the cell itself is so heterogeneous. Um, that's that's a tough thing, and and uh, I, that we may only be able to 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 get some information by selectively. Uh, deleting objects. I mean, the wonderful thing is that you, you know, there, there are ways you can uh, uh, keep the cytoskeleton relatively um, constant and then get rid of um, selected organelles and see if they are important, um, you know, that kind of stuff. But, but, but I think it's, it's a real open question. One thing we do know is that if we take a, if we take a, uh, uh, a reconstituted fiber network and we just pollute it with little particles, that does almost nothing to the uh, uncompressed shear modulus. Um, so the presence of, so I guess the implication would be the presence of stuff like the ER and, and endocytic vesicles and whatnot in, a, in the cytoplasm would not affect the overall macroscopic stiffness of the cytoskeleton because you can put a lot of objects in uh, and not perturb it. You don't see their presence so much until you start compressing. Thank you. So the next question is from Kinjal Dasmiswas, and he's asking, uh, in some tissues like vascular or neuronal, uh, the cells themselves form networks. Does this contribute to tissue elasticity? Yeah, yeah, presumably it it, it does. And, and uh, um, yeah, and especially I would think, especially in the brain, uh, where um, you know where the cells are long, you know they're long, they're full of microtubules, neurofilaments, they're they're fibrous looking. That's got to con contribute. What what um, um, and and it's hard to figure out, you know, how they contribute because they're even, I mean, the liquid droplet, I think, experiment, I think is pretty informative. It has a very big effect on the mechanical response of the fiber network, even though it itself is just liquid. Mm -hmm. So making it, and, and one of the um, um, kind of daunting things from comparing Macintosh's model to uh, Chinois is that they have uh, opposite um, assumptions on the mechanical properties of the, you know, cell equivalent uh, but those two opposite things have very similar effects on the network rheology. Mm -hmm. So it, it will be, it's going to be difficult to figure out how the mechanics of the cell impacts the mechanics of the, uh, of the composite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then, Paul, there are two questions about Sharon Lupkin and Nancy Ford about opposite limits. So Sharon is asking, you know, do these ideas also apply to epithelial tissues, presumably because you have a confluent you know, layer of cells. Yeah. And Nancy is asking about uh, tissues such as cartilage where you have very few cells and it's mostly just fiber networks. Yeah. There, you know, will those tissues more match, like, you know, more closely match just fibrous network properties? So, so these two limits, what would yep. you expect? Yeah, so we, we, we looked at cartilage and we looked at, uh, uh, oh, what's that stuff called? Um, nucleus pulposus. 
Okay. And uh, for which there is some really nice magnetic resonance elastography too. And but they they both stiffen when you compress them. And the one the one sort of um, uh, uh, what kind of kind of uh, uh, I, I thought is that in cartilage, even though the collagen network doesn't have a lot of cells in it, mm -hmm. it's the space in between the collagen fibers is loaded with glycosaminoglycans, right. which are also fantastically uh, volume conserving, right? They really don't want to be squeezed, whereas a collagen would like to be squeezed. Right. Uh, so it could be that the presence of those things uh, pushes the system to be more like that kind of uh, a Schwartz groups uh, a picture where, where you resist uh, a change in the mesh size of the, uh, of the fiber, not because there's a particle inside, but because in order to change the volume of that mesh, you would also have to squeeze the glycosaminoglycans, which they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And all right, so then there is a question. I guess this is the last question before I stop recording, and then we can have a live Q&A. This is from Brian Chung, and Brian is asking, compared to the mesh size, how big should the particles beads be to have enough effect on the shear modulus? Ah, yeah. So we're, we've, they, I, I, they need to be at least on the order of the mesh size. I think if they're smaller than the mesh size, they don't contribute. Um, then they're just another soluble object. Um, but I, I, and I, I believe Fred has looked at at, at this question to some, or, or Jordan, they have, they have, they've done some simulations with bigger and smaller particles and it doesn't make so much difference. Uh, Jen might have as well uh, to look at, at what the particle size. It, it, my memory is that it's not a gigantic effect mm -hmm. and we've been, we're, we're gonna try to do that experimentally, but we don't know yet. We, the only really controlled experiment we had was with those two liquid droplets of different sizes in which the, more, more numerous but smaller particles seem to have a bigger effect than the larger but fewer uh, uh, droplets. But I, 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 that's you know one experiment, so I, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They just have to be bigger than the mesh size. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. So I'm going to stop recording and stop.